Hello, welcome to the Friday, July 15th, 2022 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and this is the last podcast that I'll be recording this year from Sands Fire here in Washington, D.C. With me here in Washington, D.C. is Rob Vandenbringen. Rob actually wrote today's diary about an interesting network problem that he had at a client and how he identified the root cause. This was not an attack. It was sort of a self-inflicted denial of service attack. The initial indication that something went wrong was that essentially clients didn't get replies to their DHCP discover message. Turned out that it was really just uh, too much traffic going through a particular switch, maxing out the switch because of a badly configured old legacy switch that was connected to the network and then causing broadcast storms, overloading the network and preventing these DHCP messages from actually being received and responded to properly. Fixing these kind of issues, of course, always require a good mix of experience and a solid procedure in debugging networks. And hopefully you can uh, glance some of these procedures from Rob's diary. Then we got yet another method in order to de-anonymize web browsers presented in a paper by researchers from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Like some of these methods, it may be more theoretical than practical, but certainly in some targeted cases could be applied. The trickier is as so often to try to trick the victim into caching an image or any other content and then measuring how fast that content is being retrieved. This would work, for example, if the operator of a particular forum is trying to de-anonymize a particular user and has a suspicion as to, for example, what that particular user's Gmail address is. The attacker, which is the forum owner in this case, would send an image to that Gmail address and the user will likely load that image in their browser as they're opening the email. Again, this would just require opening the email, not clicking on anything or no further interaction with the email. As the victim is then visiting the forum again, that image is being requested in a frame that is displayed underneath the actual forum page. And the forum page is then measuring timing artifact in how this new frame with the image that will be loaded from Gmail uh, will be displayed. Now, if the user does not have access to that Gmail account, then of course the image will not be displayed Then that then introduces timing artifacts that can be detected. And to improve the accuracy of these timing measurements, machine learning is being used in order to decide how long it takes for particular, for example, timing events to take place. As a workaround, well, for website operators, they're recommending that pages respond with equal time, no matter whether or not the user is logged in or not logged in. Secondly, if you are displaying content, that any error messages that you're displaying if the content is not available, look very similar. So have a similar computational overhead in being rendered, and this will minimize the chance of these attacks working. Apparently this is working against all the big browsers, and well, of course, browsers could also mitigate some of this, but not really clear if it's worthwhile to browsers to really sort of you know, randomize timing of renders and such in order to prevent this fairly specific and not easy to conduct attack. And Microsoft uh, wrote up what they learned in observing a larger phishing campaign that apparently had something like a thousand different victims. This phishing campaign was a bit more sophisticated in so far as that it used a proxy in order to launch a machine in the middle attack. And in doing so, they were able to capture not just usernames and passwords, but then also 
cookies that were being set in order to remember the browser, which is a feature that's often being used to not have to use a second factor every single time you're visiting the page. So that then allowed the attacker to use the user's credentials without having access to a second factor that may have been required in order to gain access to these systems. In this particular case, webmail systems that then were used to launch a good old business email compromise attack. This is interesting in so far also that uh, in particular when you're talking about webmail systems, the ability to not have to enter a second factor every single time you're checking your email is certainly a much appreciated convenience and it may be difficult to force users to use a second factor every single time. TLS is not necessarily protecting you from these style of um, machine in the middle attacks because the victim is actually visiting a website that uses a domain name that the attacker controls. So the attacker is able to obtain a valid certificate for this particular domain name. And finally, for the VMware users out there, there is another update for VMware vCenter server. Uh, this update fixes approach escalation vulnerability in integrated Windows authentication. So apply the update in particular if you're using this form of authentication. That's it for today. Thanks again for listening. And as usual, if you like this podcast, please leave a nice review on the podcast platform of your choice to direct other people uh, to this podcast. Thanks and talk to you again on Monday.